All right then. So yeah, good morning. I hope uh, everyone's doing okay. Uh, I realised I kind of I got myself in a bit of a model uh, in terms of what the topic was. Um, so yeah, if you were expecting uh, residential sprinklers part three, uh, then yeah, I realised that that isn't actually for a couple of weeks' time. So I think that's um, sprinkler talk thirty, in fact. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at frictional losses part two uh, instead. So so hopefully it. Uh, won't make too much difference uh, to you, but yeah, I thought I'd, um, well, I noticed the mistake. Um, I thought uh, we'll go back to kind of what the original plan was, uh, which was to talk about frictional losses part two. So let's get cracking with this. So first of all, uh, a bit of a recap from part one. Uh, so again, if you haven't seen part one, uh, then that is available um, on YouTube, I would have thought by now. Um, so you can have a look at that. So we looked at uh, frictional losses uh, through pipework. Um, and uh, I explained that this is quite a, a complicated thing to calculate. And, um, and even you know, the very best models that we have and you know, the very best um, mathematics and uh, supercomputers, et cetera, it is still going to be an estimate. Of, um, of what actually goes on with water inside the pipe. You know, there's so many variables uh, to consider. Um, for example, you know, the, the smoothness of the pipe. Um, you know, the, the smoothness of the, of the pipe is, is always evolving over time um, as you know, corrosion takes hold, different chemicals in the pipe. Um, it's all going to be, say, constantly changing. And that may have um, small or, or large effects on, on how the water uh, flows through. So, so everything, just need to bear that in mind, that everything is an estimate. Um, one way of working it out is called the, the Hayes and Williams formula, uh, and this is um, something that the sprinkler industry is kind of saying, right, okay, there are obviously lots of different models and calculations that we can do, but this is the one that we are going to base uh, our figures upon, um, and say it, it kind of looks like a very uh, complicated formula. Um, but it, it's not really. So we've got P, which is the pressure loss in bar, is equal to this number at the top, there, which is obviously a, a large uh, number, um, and it's just a, a constant number. And then we're dividing that by um, a factor, uh, C, which is representing the, the type and condition of the pipe. We have the diameter of the pipe. So again, that's in there as a variable. Recording is on. Um, we also have L, the length of the pipe, and we have Q, which is the flow rate. So we kind of put all those things together, um, whack in the numbers, and we can spit out an answer, which is uh, the pressure, pressure loss over a, a period of time. Um, so as an example, um, we can look um, at, also that, that, sim that simplifies down even further. So if we if we use a few um, what's the word? Um, so if we kind of put things together into make some assumptions, that's the word I'm looking for. If we make some assumptions, we say okay, we're going to look at a thousand liters per minute all the time. Uh, the roughness, they most of the time we're looking at, at, at steel pipes, so we, that that kind of be tidied up as well. We can simplify that equation down into simply P equals Q, uh, sorry K times Q times one point well to the power one point eight five which means that we can work out a pressure loss in millibar for each meter of pipe for various different um, diameters of pipe. And that's what it, it's written down there. So um, in the example, yep, yeah, in this example here, we've got a two meter length of pipe of a nominal diameter, 100 millimeters. Um, it's 4.4 millibar of loss per meter. So it's simply two times 4.4. So we would say that we would expect a pressure loss of 8.8 .8 millibar from one end of the pipe to the other. I say all of that is, is kind of a recap. That's what we did um, in um, part one. To part two, we're now thinking, okay, well, what about what about fittings? What about other things that are going on? Uh, obviously, sprinkler systems aren't just lengths of pipe. So we have something called equivalent length. So what this is is we are um, we're taking all other kind of different types of, of equipment, such as um, fittings, elbows, tees, um, alarm valves, uh, all the kind of other kit that we are putting onto a sprinkler system, 
we will then convert that into an equivalent length. And that's, that, that makes it nice and easy then to do some calculations because then we've got, um, we've got like a standard unit with, which we can work on, which we can then add them all together at the end. Um, there's a table in uh, BSEN 12845, uh, table 23, which lists um, lots of kind of common components that say such as elbows, T's, um, valves, um, alarm valves, etc. This is quite um, an old fashioned table. Um, it, it's still, you know, in, in use, it's still kind of uh, being used. But for example, there aren't any grooved fittings uh, in that table. So the, the elbows are either screwed elbows or they're welded elbows. And say, as you know, we, for, for, for sizes that are kind of larger than, than 50 millimeters, we wouldn't be using screwed. Uh, welded fittings, yeah, don't really use them anymore. I mean, we may do if it's um, prefabricated, but, you know, groove couplings have become um, so much more of the standard um, in terms of the speed of, of putting things in. But they aren't actually listed there. Um, now that, that's okay. You know, we would just use um, we just use screwed uh, instead. Um, we can take that figure, um, but that's just a, there is a table there, 20, table 23, and I've taken one example from there, a 90 degree elbow. So we've got a nominal diameter is 20, all the way up to 200, and that number there. So for example, a 90 degree elbow, which is um, 40 millimeters nominal diameter, would have an equivalent length of 1.2 meters of pipe. So you can see that the, now you may be wondering why the equivalent length is going up as the size of the fittings is going up. Um, because remember I told you um, in that previous slide here that the bigger the pipe, the lower the frictional loss. Uh, and that, that is true per meter the amount of frictional loss is smaller. And that's because, um, you know, frictional loss is all about a drag, essentially. It's about friction. Um, and the bigger the pipe, um, that the less water, percentage of water is touching the sides, and therefore there's less um, friction created. So, so that's true. Um, the larger the pipe, um, the smaller the frictional loss. But in terms of uh, changing direction, we've obviously got a lot more water to change direction. So that, that's why the you know, friction loss does go up um, from a small size to a big size. And again, this is um, looking at, um, so this is kind of pre-calculated, it's tables. So we've taken some assumptions in here. So this is for um, say steel pipe with a C value of 120 and a flow rate of nominally 1000 liters per minute. And so we, we, we do that just for kind of ease of use um, the, the, flow right, fl 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 the flow rate is likely to be uh, a lot smaller than that, um, certainly as a kind of an average flow rate um, over the whole system. So again, everything's kind of built in with kind of safety margins. So to, to summarize what I'm, what I'm saying, uh, maybe I'm not doing a great job of saying it, um, but yeah, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that a 40 millimeter screwed elbow, such as that, has the same frictional loss as a 1.2 meter length of the same diameter pipe. So a 40 millimeter pipe that's 1.2 millimeters long would experience the same frictional loss as the water going through a screwed elbow. Um, and that's say because when the water goes through the elbow, you know, it is bashing into that, that corner, you know, as it's kind of speeding along the pipe, it reaches the corner, it's gonna splat into the wall, and then kind of move around. So there's quite a lot of friction generated uh, when changing direction um, of, um, of cha you know, water changing direction generates a lot of extra additional frictional loss. So hope that kind of makes sense that um, all of these components will have what's called an equivalent length. And then you say it becomes nice and easy then to add them together later on. You can also go direct to uh, manufacturers. So for example here, um, this is a reliable uh, alarm valve. Uh, so in the data sheet for that, uh, they're calling it a bulletin, but yeah, same thing, data sheet in there. It says, okay, so if you've got a four inch, then the equivalent length is given there in, in, in feet as well as uh, meters. 
So a four inch uh, a Model E alarm valve has got an equivalent length of 5.18. The six inch, it's 8.23 meters. And for eight inch, it's 8.84 in, uh, meters. So again, it, 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 the manufacturers will also have um, a measurement um, that might be more than what's said in table 23, it might be less. Um, they would have done some actual practical um, test on it to actually establish what the equivalent length is. And obviously that, that's fairly easy to do. You just create um, a flow rate of 1,000 litres a minute. You measure the pressure on one side, you measure the pressure on the other, on the other and you can, you can clearly see what the frictional loss is. So, so you can use the, the table that's in the standard, or you can actually go direct to the manufacturers and ask them, you know, what is their equivalent length of the piece of equipment that they've got. Okay, let's let's change tack slightly and let's talk about design points. Um, so all of this is kind of talking about how to calculate frictional loss. Why do we want to calculate frictional loss? Well, we want to make sure that our sprinkler system is going to work um, work effectively uh, when it's called into action. That's the whole point of what we're trying to do which means we need um, a minimum flow rate and a minimum pressure. Okay, so each and every sprinkler head on our system needs to be able to, to have a, a, a minimum amount of pressure. The ordinary hazard is 0.35 bar. Okay, so every sprinkler head needs at least 0.35 bar in order to actually work, in order for the water to be discharged effectively to actually get the, the spray pattern that we want. And we also need a given flow rate to actually meet uh, the minimum requirements in terms of discharge of water. Um, so again, you know, we need to actually put uh, an amount of water onto the fire, otherwise it's not going to do its job effectively. So that, that's a whole reason why we want to calculate frictional loss, is to ensure that we've got enough water going to each and every sprinkler head on our system. Um, this is a uh, this is one method of working it out. Um, Say so it is kind of what I'm talking about here, um, which is called pre-calculated or table method uh, of working these things out. The, the alternative is to use a, a, a computer. Essentially, what you would do is you would um, there's various pieces of software that you can buy. Uh, Canute uh, being um, one of the kind of leading uh, names in this. Where what you would do is you would basically model the whole system on the computer. You would tell it where all the heads are, all the pipe, and it would work out very quickly what the pressure and flow is at every single point on the system. And then obviously you can tweak it, you can mess about with it, and you can make sure that everything's working. The alternative, say, is these, these pre-calculated tables. And that's kind of what I'm talking about here in this example. So um, you only have to size a very small amount of the pipe work um, on this kind of a system. So you can see I've got this, this large kind of warehouse um, style setup. So all of those black dots are sprinkler heads. I've got my water storage tanks. I've got my pump house at the top there. Now that's leading down uh, into the building. Um, the, the black square is my insulation control valve. And then you can see the pipe work spreads out um, and we have a network of pipes and then lots of the sprinkler heads. Lots of different ways you could lay it out. And I say that that's kind of dependent on the, the fabric of the building, you know, where the beams go, where you've got racking and uh, mezzanine levels. I mean, all, all of that's going to come into play. Uh, this is just an example. Um, hopefully you can see the difference between the, the purple lines and the gray lines. Um, looking at it now on the screen, I wish I'd sort of chosen a different uh, kind of color scheme to make it a bit more obvious to you. But um, the, you only need to size the purple lines. So it's actually not a great deal of this system. All of the smaller bore pipe is, um, is sized by, again, via tables. There are tables that tell you, OK, how many heads are you serving off this piece of pipe? Four, for example, OK, in that case, the minimum uh, diameter pipe you can use is 40. At most of the time, we, will be, we, we don't want to oversize the pipes. Oversizing the pipes uh, means that the pipe is more expensive because there's more material. It's obviously heavier. 
so it's harder to work with. We need more um, ports in place, um, and it takes up more space. So yeah, there's, there's no kind of problem in oversizing the pipes, except say kind of cost, labour, time, etc. So um, yeah, we will only, we only, we only kind of use the minimum we can. So say so all of those, um, the smaller bore pipe is sized just by looking up in a table, and it'll tell you what size to use. The the ones that are in purple actually have to be sort of sized by you, the, the designer. You would actually decide uh, how big they need to be. And on this system, we have various design points. Now, the design points, again, are, um, are calculated by looking up in, in a table. Most of the time, it is after the 18th sprinkler head. So wherever the 18th sprinkler head falls, um, or to the 19th head, kind of after the 18th head, if you like, you work it back to the nearest range, and then that is a design point. So I would need to work out, remember the, the black square is my insulation control valve. I'm interested in the journey of the water from that square to point A, from that black square to B, from the black square to C, to D, to E, to F, G, H, I, and J. Okay, so I'm interested in that journey, and that's what I'm going to be sort of calculating to ensure that all works fine. Now, common sense tells me that if the water can get to A with enough pressure, then C, E, D, and F should be absolutely fine because they are a lot closer to the pumps, a lot closer to the insulation control valve than A, B, I, and J. Okay, there they are what's called my remote point. Um, obviously, being a good designer, I would be um, calculating to all of the points, you know, just to kind of prove that they all work. But yeah, common sense tells us that if it's okay for the furthest points, it'll be okay for the closest points as well. But that's that's kind of another another story because it's the water storage which we need to look at for the, the points closest. Um, the, the the main rule that we're looking at as far as sizing the pipes is we're allowed 500 millibar loss from our installation control valve, our black square, to each of those points on the the board. If we can achieve that, then again it'll it'll just work um, because our um, the pre-calculated systems again has been put together with lots of safety margins. Um, you know, there's, there's tables to follow. Is it this? Is it this? Look here, look here. It, it will, if you manage to get less than 500 millibar loss from the initialization control valve to the design point, then the system will just work because it's, it's already been pre calculated, pre thought out, uh, and designed in that way. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, I should have put that up earlier. So, yeah, that's our insulation control valve, so that the black square there. So, say so we're interested in that journey. Uh, here's another example. So, it was a kind of 3D. Um, uh, drawing again showing our insulation control valve at the bottom there, and then our different ranges going off to different areas. And again, we'd have some design points to work from. So, we'll be looking for at the journey um, from the insulation control valve to each of those design points. Uh, here's another one. I'm actually going to kind of do a, a practical example here. So we've got insulation control valve, and we have, we're going to design point A. So you can see I've labelled the pipe there. So we've got runs A, B, C, and D. Um, I know we're kind of using A twice. Uh, forgive me for that. So I've got pipe run A, B, C, and D, and I've got design point A, uh, which is in the, the yellow uh, triangle, and an insulation control valve within the purple triangle. Um, and on the table on the left-hand side there, you can see that pipe run A is in a 100 millimeter diameter pipe, and it's five meters in length. Pipe run B is also 100 millimeters in diameter, and it's 10 meters. So the, the drawing, you know, isn't, isn't to scale, if you like. Uh, C is 80 millimeters in diameter, which means that the, the elbow between B and C is likely to be a reducing elbow, so we're changing diameter at that point. So C is 15 meters long, and then pipe run D 
is 80 millimeters in diameter and it's five meters of pipe run. Um, so that, that's all the pipe taken cared, taken cared for, um, but there are some other fittings. So we have some elbows. Um, now it says two 80 millimeter screwed elbows. So where it's reducing, we just take the smaller size. So there isn't um, a, an equivalent length in table 23, this is from, from BSEN 12845, there isn't an equivalent length for reducing elbows. We simply take the smallest uh, size because that's kind of the, the, the worst case. Oh no, sorry, we take the largest size, don't we? We take the largest size, not the small size. Um, and then we have a butterfly valve as well, which is at the top of the insulation control valve. Um, then we're going to add up all of the um, equivalent lengths. So starting off with a 100 millimeter pipe, we've got the five meters from uh, pipe run A. We've got the 10 meters from pipe run B. In terms of our 100 millimeter fittings, we've got a butterfly valve and we've got an elbow. OK, so the butterfly valve has an equivalent length of 4.6 meters and the screwed elbow has an equivalent length of three meters. So add all those up together, we get 22.6 meters in total. The 100 millimeter pipe has a loss per meter of 4.4. So 22.6 so times 4.4 is 99.44 millibar for the 100 millimeter diameter size. Then we look at the 80 millimeter size. So we've got 15 meters, that's C. Pipe one C is 15 meters. Pipe one D is five meters. We've got 15 and five in the pipe length. Fittings, we've got two screwed elbows. And each of those elbows has got an equivalent length of 2.4. So again, we add all those up together and we get 24.8. The equivalent, uh, sorry, the um, pressure loss per meter of 80 millimeter pipe is 16. So then we do 24.8 times 16 and we get 396.8. And then if you, if you're following me, if you kind of keep it up with this, then we, we add together those two um, numbers. So we've got our 99.44 and our 396.8, and we get 496.24. Is that good or is that bad? Can you remember? What, what was the maximum length, or sorry, what was the maximum uh, loss that we were allowed from the insulation control valve to any design point? It was 500. So we're allowed 500 millibar, half a, half a bar, and we've got 496.24. So that's good, right? It, it is and it isn't actually. Um, it is good, okay? So that is a perfectly um, compliant design. Um, if we got um, 550, say, millibar, then that would be no good. And we would, we would correct that by changing the pipe diameter. So we can sort of mess about with the pipe diameter and we can run it again. The, so length C, for example, pipe run C is shown in 80 millimeter pipe. If we make that pipe run in 100 millimeter pipe, then we will reduce the frictional total frictional loss calculated. So we could change C to 100 and then we could run the calculations again and we can get a different answer, which will be a lot, lot lower than the answer we had before because there's 15 meters worth. Um, so that's going to be add up to quite a big difference. And so that's what the, the FHC, that's what the, the computer software is doing. Um, that's why, say, you know, it's kind of messing about with the design, um, playing about with different pipe diameters on the computer is very quick and very easy because, of course, it can just kind of do that very, very quickly. For us, doing these pre-calculated um, versions, um, we would have to then, you know, fresh piece of paper uh, and we work it out again and we get a different answer. But yeah, 496 is, is fully compliant. It's a, it's a perfectly um, good answer. However, um, 
as a designer in kind of practicality terms, I wouldn't be very happy with that. It's a bit close for me. And that's because um, we would have to install it exactly to drawing when we go onto site. So if we get to site, for example, and we find that, oh, there, there's a beam there, uh, which we weren't expecting, or, you know, th th things happen on site, don't they? Um, plans change, um, or the walls moved a little bit further back. So we've now got to go kind of round it. As soon as we start adding elbows, for example, onto this design, our frictional loss is going to go over 500. And then we've got a big problem. So for me, I would want more of a safety margin. I would want to be, I would want to be lower. You know, let's say for argument's sake, if we're 400 millibar, um, then we've, we've got a little bit to play with there. We, we can add a little bit here, a little bit there, um, and we can still be under the 500 maximum. Hope that makes sense. Kind of, you know, in, in practical terms, we want to make sure that we've got a little bit of uh, a leeway there. Um, last thing I want to talk about is uh, static head and static gain. Um, so static head is uh, the pressure required to overcome uh, the force of gravity. Okay, so um, yeah, we all all familiar with gravity. Um, we need the the pumps are generally speaking on the uh, the ground floor or on the basement levels. Uh, our highest sprinkler heads uh, are going to be, you know, at least one floor above. Uh, maybe two, three, you know, they're going to be above the, the pump anyway. So we need to make sure that we've got enough uh, force in the pump. We need to got enough um, power in there to push the water up to overcome the force of gravity. So we've got our frictional loss. We've also got our losses due to gravity. We call that static or static head. Um, so it to lift water one meter, we need 0.098 or 0.1 bar uh, at the bottom to get zero at the top. So as a rule of thumb, for every 10 meters to go up, you need an extra one bar of pressure at the bottom um, to vertically to go upwards. So just need to remember that in order to get from the installation control valve to design point A or B, you know, we need to look at the, um, the frictional loss through the pipe and also the static loss due to gravity, which is yeah, a lot easier to, to, to cope with, really, because that's just the vertical height. Um, we then can get something called static gain. So design point B, for example, you can see that that floor is lower than A. Um, I'm not going to go into this in, in, in massive detail, but um, the pump is either on or it's off. You know, it, it is either running or it's not running. Um, and so the, the pump is going to be sized for the worst case scenario. So it needs to get to the top of the building. That means for the de for design points that are lower, we actually get a bit of kind of bit of bonus really because the pump is oversized essentially for the, the lower design points. So we can actually add on the, the height difference. In this case, from A to B, uh, we can add that on a static gain. Um, because it, it, it like the, um, it's like we're using, we're using kind of gravity in our favor this time. We're not, of course, but the pump, say, is oversized to compensate for getting up to the top levels so we can kind of add it on to design point B, i.e. we can make the pipe work a little bit smaller around the design point B area because we've got some extra pressure to work with. Hope that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. Um, so the, these, these presentations are only really designed to give you a flavor uh, of what's going on. Um, but yeah, hopefully static head makes sense. Static gain, yeah, maybe not, maybe it does. Um, so it doesn't matter too much. Uh, yeah, that's just a little summary of what I've just said there in terms of looking at different design points at different levels. Um, and this is just an example here of a calculation sheet. So this is what um, a sprinkler designer will be doing uh, if they're doing pre-calculated. And um, you, you would, I, I guess you would get a similar kind of readout from the computer. If you're doing FHC, you would get a similar kind of readout. It says, okay, um, pressure at design point A, pressure at design point B, flow rate, et cetera, et cetera. It'll all be kind of printed out in a similar way to this. But yeah, you'd have these calculation sheets, which you kind of go through, adding up all the equivalent lengths and giving an answer. And that's what you'll be submitting with your sprinkler design. And uh, that is that. Um, so, yeah, uh, 
I say hopefully that that made some sense. Um, if it didn't, then yeah, go back, kind of watch it again, uh, listen again. Um, if you do have um, some questions, say, do pop them in the uh, in the comments uh, or send me an email. Um, but as I say, yeah, this is really only there to give you a flavour of what's going on. I'm not looking to to kind of teach you how to do um, sprinkler frictional loss calculations. It's just again an, an appreciation for what is actually going on behind the scenes in terms of working out all of these things to make sure that the sprinkler system works uh, as designed. Again, because that, that's that's the whole point. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at the latest sprinkler news. Um, so again, just catching up on uh, things that have changed in terms of standards, um, in terms of um, uh, legislation, um, products, you know, things that are kind of coming out there, what, what's, what's happening um, in terms of sprinklers. So I'll giving, be giving you an update on that next week. Great, so yeah, I hope you found that useful. Uh, as per usual, I'm just going to stick around a few minutes and see if there's some questions. <laughs> yeah, so, some hard sums indeed, yeah, but uh, we got there. And again, you, you, can, you can watch it um, watch it back and uh, kind of follow along maybe next time. <laughs>